Dr. Pamela Ruig, Extension Milk Quality Veterinarian for the University of Wisconsin-Madison. With this video, we're introducing a new series that's focused on how to effectively milk cows to produce high quality milk. The title of this series is The Seven Habits of Highly Successful Milking Routines. In this series, we're going to discuss and break down the science behind the steps of an effective milking routine, and we're going to divide it into seven uh, practical habits that you can try on your farm. Today, we're going to start with the background and some of the um, goals and objectives of that milking routine. The milking routine is a critical control point in the production of high quality milk. And when we think about a milking routine, we can't just think about getting the job done, running out and doing a task rapidly. When we think about the milking routine, what we should be focusing on is practices that will help us produce a high quality food product that consumers desire. When we think about the steps that we do in the milking parlor, we have to remember that those steps are just a means to meet that objective. The steps that we'll be discussing in this series include attaching teat cups to visibly clean, well-stimulated teats, removing milk rapidly, and removing the units when milking is completed. These steps in the milking routine, when properly performed, will result in the production of high quality milk. Highly effective milking practices are based on having great milking parlor management. And we have data from a study we conducted several years ago that really demonstrate that concept. In this particular study, we enrolled approximately 101 Wisconsin commercial uh, dairy operators that milk cows in milking parlors. These weren't um, farms that were representative of farms in Wisconsin. These were actually farms that had milk quality problems and wanted to improve. On average, there were about 400 cows in these herds, and the bulk tank somatic cell count was higher than the farms wanted. It was um, over 300,000 cells per mil. The interesting thing about this group of farms that was having a milk quality problem was that they already had very high adoption of many of the practices that we experts recommend to that will result in the production of high quality milk. For example, when the farmers enrolled in our milk quality improvement project, 89% of the operations already had the milkers wearing milking gloves. Almost all of the farms were using post-dip. Almost all of the farms were using pre-dip. And almost 90% of the farms were for stripping milk before attaching the milking unit. One of the things that we had to look at then is why, if they already had such high adoption of these practices, was the milking performance and the quality of the milk not as high as it should be. So we looked a little deeper. On these farms, on average, they had six different people milking the cows each month. And one of the things we zeroed in on was training. We asked all of the farms the frequency of training the milking technicians. Only 22% of the farms told us that they frequently trained the milking technicians about 50% of the farms told us they only trained the milking technicians at the time they were hired, and fully one-third of the farms said that they simply never trained the milking technicians. We went even a little deeper and asked them, do you have written milking procedures that you provide to your t milking technicians? And only 41% of the farms answered that yes, they had written instructions for their milking technicians. Now I go to many farms, and often farmers will say to me, you know, my milking technicians are not doing what they're supposed to do in the milking parlor. But often I'll come back to them and say, well, of course not. Are you effectively training them on a frequent enough basis? And have we provided good instructions for them? And in many instances, we find that these two criteria of training and written instructions simply aren't met. And the failure to train and the failure to have written instructions is linked to many of the outcomes that we see in the milking parlor. <music> 
the use of these standardized best management practices such as training and having a written milking routine and using a complete milking routine are highly associated with many of the important outcomes that we're looking at in the milking parlor. One of the things that we looked at in our study was the efficiency of milking. And the way that we measured that was we looked at the relationship between many of these important best management practices and the number of cows that were milked per hour per milking technician in the parlor. So for example, we looked at herds that had written milking routines and herds that did not, and we found a strong association. Herds that had written milking routine milked almost 50 cows per hour per operator or milking technician versus 35 cows per hour per milking technician that were milked in farms that did not have written milking routines. When we looked at training frequency, we found a very strong association. Herds that never trained their milking technicians milked only about 35 cows per hour per milking technician in contrast to about 50 cows per hour per milking technician for herds that were training their um, milking technicians frequently. We also looked at some of the things we do in the parlor, the, mil the steps in the milking routine. We found that farms that four stripped and had a complete milking routine milk cows faster as compared to farms that did not adopt these practices. And finally, we combined the complete milking routine and frequent training. And we found that herds that had a complete milking routine, which consists of pre-dip, dry, four-strip, uh, attach, and of course post-dip, herds that used all of those steps and trained their milking technicians frequently actually were the most efficient in their milking parlor. The adoption of these standardized best management practices and training is not only associated with efficiency in the milking parlor, these practices are also associated with the monthly rate of clinical mastitis. In our study, we statistically looked at herds that had adopted written routines, frequent training, the use of a complete routine, and force stripping as part of that routine, and found that in every instance, the herds that had adopted those practices reported lower rates of clinical mastitis in their lactating dairy cows. The use of these practices is strongly associated with both more efficient milking and also with better udder health. In this series, we're going to be discussing the seven habits of a highly effective milking routine. But we can't look at just the milking routine in isolation of the rest of the mastitis control practices on the farm. We know, based on years of effective control of contagious mastitis, that we have to first implement the five-point mastitis control plan. Those five points that need to be successfully implemented include effective post-milking teat dipping, use of dry cow therapy and a microbial dry cow therapy of every quarter of every cow at the end of every lactation, appropriate treatment of clinical cases, culling of chronically infected cows, and regular maintenance of the milking equipment. When we have a highly effective milking routine and couple it with effective implementation of, a mastitis, of the five-point mastitis control plan, we will result in the production of high quality milk. So when we're implementing these effective habits of our milking routine, we also have to make sure that we measure the, the performance. And to do that, we need to be aware of some key performance indicators. We can measure average claw vacuum to make sure that we maintain a stable T to end vacuum. And using English units, we'd recommend that the goal for that is 10 and a half to 12 and a half inches of mercury, which is approximately 35 to 42 kPa. We also want to look at the maximum claw vacuum fluctuation. We'd like that to be less than three inches of mercury or less than 10 kPa. It's also important to uh, measure average milk flow. And when we look at the average milk flow during 
the milking time, we'd like it to be somewhere in the range of five to eight pounds per minute, which is about 2.3 to uh, 4.0 kilos per minute. We also want to look at for, for uh, the milking parlors that are using automatic detachers, automatic cluster removers, we'd like to look at and monitor the amount of time that the milking technicians use the manual mode of milking. And we would like to minimize that, and we believe an, uh, a good goal for that would be less than 5% of milkings. And then finally, when we look at the milking machines, a key performance indicator is the D phase of the pulsation cycle. And our uh, goal for that is to hit at least 150 to 200 milliseconds for that D phase. We also have a number of key performance indicators that we can use to monitor the milking performance. For example, we'd like to have at least 30 seconds of contact time of the pre-dip before it's dried off so that we have sufficient time to kill the bacteria. We should measure the amount of time from stimulation until the milking unit is attached. We call that the prep lag time and it should be approximately at least 60 seconds and it can extend up to 120 or even 180 seconds. Another thing to monitor during the milking process is the amount of time that the milking unit is actually attached in milking. The duration of active milking should be approximately three to eight minutes depending on milking production in the herd. Very rarely would you need to exceed eight minutes of attachment time. And then finally, we want to measure and monitor the percentage of the teats that have at least 75% of the teat skin covered with the post-milking teat disinfectant. And we'd like to see at least 90% of those teats with good coverage. So with this background, we're going to move on into this series to discuss the seven critical habits which will contribute to a successful milking routine. The next video in this series is going to discuss habit one. And habit one starts before the cows ever enter the milking parlor. And that's that cows are calm and clean before milking.